We're in Huntsville, Alabama to find out more about Operation Paperclip and its legacy for the American space program and Nazi UFOs. Hi, Bill. Nice to meet you. Hi. Thank you for meeting with us today. Operation Paperclip originally started in September of 1946 to bring former Nazi rocket scientists and aeronautical engineers into the United States, and they were actually given political immunity in exchange for technical expertise. Michael Schratt is an aviation historian who specializes in reporting how the military-industrial complex covers up black operations. Now we're investigating the possibility that some flying saucer technology came over from Germany into the United States. What evidence is there for that? There is a paper trail to reference for this, and this is an actual Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Air Material Command document and it basically shows you how this technology was brought from the Third Reich and trickled into the aerospace industry. It starts up here on the upper left-hand corner, German Air Force, then it goes into the Luftwaffe, German Research and Technical Institutions, German Aircraft Industry. That flows then to the Air Documents Division, or T2, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And then that gets filtered on to the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, U.S. Army, American industry, and universities. T2 was the Air Technical Intelligence Division of the United States military. Based in Wright Field, Ohio, it analyzed all the documents pertaining to Operation Paperclip. They also investigated UFO reports. We have some really good evidence that, in fact, some of the British and Canadian designs were, in point of fact, procured from the German originals. They were working on what was called a VTOL supersonic gyroplane using a radial thrust engine, and that's Project Y. Project Y was an attempt to create a vertical takeoff and landing space car. It was better known as the Avro car, films of which show how hard it was to corral a flying saucer. We were investigating the bell before. Did any of that transfer over here? The bell, which was approximately 15 feet high, 12 feet in diameter, it had two counter-rotating drums on the upper section of the bell. There was a central shaft that went down the center of the craft that terminated in what's called the thermos bottle. And from the Germans' own documents, we know that a, a chemical called cerium-525 was actually pumped into this vehicle, and that represented the plasma vortex that was created by this craft. Is this some kind of writing or inscription around the base? Back in December 9th, 1965, we had an almost identical looking craft crash in the woods of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, and it too had the same or similar hieroglyphic writing. Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, 1965. A strange looking craft allegedly crashes and it looks a lot like the Glocka. Thousands of people see it and they even have a monument there now. now. Supposedly, it was carted off by the military. So the line of reasoning is Nazis create the Glocka. Their technology comes to the US along with the German scientists and they create more of these craft. Since these craft are identical, is there a human link between Der Glocke in the 1940s and Kecksburg 1960s. In fact, the gentleman who was the senior project design engineer for the Bell program was a man by the name of Kurt Davis. Davis was launch director at NASA between 1962 and 1974. This is the bombshell we've been waiting for. Kurt Davis, an electrical engineer who actually was part of Project Riza and the Glocka comes to America to work for NASA. He winds up the launch director of NASA in the 1960s, just when the event at Kecksburg takes place in December 1965. This is the proof that I need that some of the UFOs we see are man-made. Some of what we're seeing up there isn't them, it's us.